Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to talk about designing for the best checkout process. And your goal here, and your goal always when it comes to any sort of payments interaction, whether it's on a mobile or on a desktop, is conversion. Once that customer, that valued individual, is trying to buy something from you, you want to make it as easy as possible. So when they come to visit, they end up with a purchase at the end of the day. And most of you know, or certainly should know, that with mobile, design is incredibly important. It's incredibly important because of the nature of the ecosystem and combining software and hardware, as well as the fact that we as consumers have been trained to expect certain things from mobile apps. There's very little leeway for making errors, there's very little patience for things taking too long, and there's an expectation that it's going to be as fast as um, a Wi-Fi connected or even P or Ethernet cable connected PC. So here at Judo, we've spent a lot of time with consumers, and in fact, we do about 80 consumer panels a month to test different types of checkout flows. And some of the findings we had were straightforward, and others were pretty surprising. The end result of that is the UI that you see in our SDK. Um, and we've seen a lot of people take that UI and break it apart because it makes more sense for their brand. But there's some things that actually make a little bit less sense than the basic UI that comes out. And I'll walk through some general design principles right now and also talk to you about some of the, not necessarily mistakes, but less than perfect implementations we've seen of, of the UI in a checkout process. And so there's really five key things to remember when designing for an optimized checkout process. The first, and this should be true across your entire app, is only ask for fields that you absolutely require. If you're used to, in a PC world, having your required fields and your optional fields, you need to throw that playbook away. If there's anything that's optional about the field, it means you don't need it at that point in time, and there's no reason for you to gather it. On a mobile device, tapping into it is much more difficult than it is on a keyboard. And therefore, you want to limit the number of interactions that the customer might have. When we put in front of consumers a page with three fields, and then we put a page within 10 fields, and we simply measured how frequently do you just pull away, the impact of having an additional seven fields from three to 10 was a 4x change in the number of people who went through to the next step. And all of that was was how we were asking for address information in addition to basic card details. And in our SDK, we don't need your address information. The second is about pulling your customers in. And that's tied to that first piece around only getting the data that you need. And so, again, with a customer, and you think about that consumer psychology, when are they going to be willing to give you what piece of information? And how much information do you tell them that you're going to need to collect from them before you shift them in a different direction? And so a great example at checkout is the most important thing you need is their credit card number. Once you have that number, they feel invested in the transaction and they're highly likely to complete that transaction. And so if a requirement for your checkout process is an email address, for example, you always want to put that after they've completed the payment. You've pulled them into the process at that point. So you'll see again in our SDK, it appears that there's two separate screens when entering the card details instead of having the 16-digit card number layered on top of the expiry date in the CB2. And again here, we saw dramatic increases in conversion when you don't show the customer that there's more information that they have to enter. It's not that they really worry about giving you that information, it's that that psychology says to them, wow, there's a lot I need to do here. I'm not ready to engage in this right now. And that's particularly true when you're on the mobile and you're on the move. The third, and again, important for all aspects of designing for your mobile app, is ensuring that you build lightweight. Our enemy, all of our enemy, when it comes to a mobile app, is that little ticking symbol that you see on your phone. That symbol that says, I'm waiting. I'm trying to do something. And what I want to have happen isn't happening right now. And so you as an app developer have two things to think about when you're building lightweight. First is the point of download. So when they're bringing that app onto their phone as a consumer, you want to assume that they are on a relatively normal 3G network. How long is it going to take them to download that application? You want to keep that as short as possible while maintaining the integrity of what you're trying to do. The second part, and specific to any time when you need to do server calls, is 
don't make them leave the app. And if they do leave the app, think about what you're loading to bring it in and why. Um, and so this might be going back to your actual uh, servers in order to pull up product information. It may be going out to your payment gateway if you're not using Judo to make a payment. But any time that there's a kind of couple of second delay, you're losing a huge portion of your customers. Google put out some numbers a little while back that said the average customer expects a web page to load on a mobile device in one second, which in a lot of instances is kind of preposterous. They are willing to wait for two seconds, but after three seconds you lose 20% of your users, at five seconds you've lost 50%, and at seven seconds you've lost over 80% of your users. Now an average server call on a mobile device can take up to a second, and you need to really think about, well, it can actually take longer, but really think about are you building lightweight? Are you thinking about those load times in every single instance? This next one, rule number four, is the one that infuriates me the most because it's so simple. Have the right keyboard at the right time. If the only thing you're asking for is numeric, then don't bring up an alphanumeric keyboard. If you know you're asking for an email address, ensure that the at symbol is part of that base keyboard. These little changes have a dramatic impact not only on the conversion of the individual customer, but also on their perception of what you're putting forth and what your product is. And that leads finally into this last piece, which is building trust. In a checkout process in particular, you need to convey to your consumer that you are a trustworthy entity. And there's a reason for them to be giving you their card details and for them to share any personal information if you're requesting that as well. This starts with general design and UX on your entire mobile app. Is it well done? Is it uh, well put together? Are the colors coordinated? Kind of basics around that. But when it comes to your app, there's actually really dramatic differences that come up by doing simple, three simple things. One is put in a picture of a lock. Um, ensuring that this is tied to the fact that it actually is a secure server. But consumers have been taught to see that security lock, that little locker symbol, and know that, okay, this indicates that this site is secure. The second is give them text that tells them that this is a secure environment that they're in. And finally, the third is to use other, if you're not a big player, to use the logos and the brands that reinforce the strength of the Visa and MasterCard network. If you are being allowed to accept cards by Visa and MasterCard, you have gone through a vetting process by an organization which by Visa and MasterCard themselves has said you are a good institution to take care of our cardholders' finances. And as a result, those brands are important to bring into your checkout process to share with that user and get that trust pulled over to your own site. And again, all of this is what we've reflected directly in our SDK. But some interesting things have also come up that I'd like to share with you. And one that we hear a lot is, why don't you do card scanning? Um, and in the North American market in particular, card scanning is pretty typical. So instead of tapping in the card numbers, you would scan a picture of a, uh, a card and it would automatically read the card number and the expiry date. And there are quite a few play players out there that provide this service. What we found in the UK, at least now, is that consumers really don't like this. And they don't like it because they don't know what's gonna happen with the picture that's been taken and they don't trust the environment yet. We're pretty sure that this is going to change over time. But when it comes down to things like that that seem like neat next generation tools for simplifying a process, make sure you take that step back and you think about how does the consumer actually view this and ensuring that it's not just the leading edge adopters but the average consumer that you're going after. So again, here at Judo we spend a lot of time designing for the consumer to ensure that the payment process is as smooth as simple as possible. And it's for this reason, is a primary reason, why we see almost a 6x increase in conversion when pe people work with us. But whether you're going to use us or someone else, I recommend you follow these principles, and we're always here to help. Give us a call, and we'll tell you everything we've learned from talking to thousands of consumers across the UK. Thank you.